So this will be the discussion of market efficiency and some corporate finance decisions. The topics I'm going to cover today uh, will be about the difference between an investment and a financing decision. I'll talk about the efficient market hypothesis, talk about bubbles and market efficiency, uh, briefly touch on behavioral finance, and then finally we'll have five lessons of market efficiency. Uh, then I'll move on to start talking more about uh, the corporate finance decision. So we'll talk about the patterns of corporate financing. We'll have a brief discussion on stock uh, and then debt. Uh, we're also going to talk about financial markets and intermediaries, the roles that they play. And um, that will conclude this particular module. So as always, things come back to NPV, right? So uh, NPV, uh, we always use discount rates, and we've talked about how we create the discount rates, how we adjust them based on additional risk. Um, we know that we have market prices that we can go look at uh, to, to use uh, to estimate those risk adjustments. And also, um, as we change discount rates, it can change the value of our assets. So when we think about uh, taking a loan, perhaps, you know, uh, and then investing that, we can use an example to calculate the NPV of that. So there's an example of the government uh, lending $100,000 for 10 years at 3% and only requiring interest payments prior to maturity, uh, in which case we'll pay back the 100,000, right? So we, we borrow 100,000, we're gonna pay back 3,000 a year and then pay back the 100,000 at the end of 10 years. Um, and then what is the, the value today? Well, if we're using a 10% discount rate, um, which is obviously much higher than the 3% discount rate, um, uh, then we would come up with uh, a, a positive NPV, which is why we would say we, sh we should definitely invest in this. So uh, as we're going through, we're just gonna continue to use that NPV approach, right? Uh, but just to understand, um, that's, that's how we're going to, to value these potential investments. All right, so moving on um, from that little refresher to, to talk about the efficient market um, hypothesis. Um, basically, the efficient market hypothesis is saying uh, there is not a pattern, right? You can't guess what the stock price is going to do in a day based on what you saw it do in the past, right? And we're going to talk about different forms of that, that efficiency. Um, but just as a general rule, when we talk about this efficiency, we're, we're talking about how efficient the market is at taking information and getting that reflected into the price. So, and if you see here, this uh, little path, obviously stock doesn't go back and forth through time, uh, just up and down, but we, um, we will uh, see this and, and we refer to this often as a random walk, right? So there's not really a rhyme or reason. Uh, you can have drift and, and things like that in it, but but the steps themselves are considered to be random, right? And uh, this is just to show uh, basically like a, a game version, you know, you could just be flipping a coin heads or tails. Uh, and as you do so, you're moving through, you know, cause you're gaining or losing value. Um, and so it's just, this is how you can kind of think of stocks, you know, at every second there's a coin flip, does it go up or down? Okay, and then the next second there's a coin flip, does it go up or down? And, and you can just sort of think of uh, this type of tree branching off, but it doing it every tick, so. All right, so when we, again, when we talk about the efficient market theory, there's three different forms uh, that we're gonna talk about. So the first is weak form. Uh, and this basically just says, look, the market price reflects all the historic information, right? That, that's really all that we can say about prices, okay? Uh, Semi-strong says that market prices reflect all publicly, in, publicly available information. So you could not use the 10K or the 10Q or anything and invest on that. Um, and then the strong form uh, is really just saying all information is there. So you could not even have insider trading. Right, so we're pretty sure strong form doesn't really hold because we do have to worry about uh, insider trading, although there's been a lot of research on how a lot of that information actually does leak into the market early uh, through various means, um, which would in indicate that we have a, a stronger form. Uh, without, uh, with, if we are in weak form efficiency, we can't even do what's known as technical trading. That's where you look for patterns and, and that kind of thing. 
uh, semi-strong form would say you can't do um, fundamental uh, analysis and fundamental investing like uh, what Warren Buffett would do. Um, you know, so it, and the market itself seems to sometimes move in between best. Sometimes it's more efficient than others. Uh, but that's when we talk about this market efficiency, this is what we're talking about. How, how well does the information work its way into the market uh, and, and get reflected in prices? Okay. Uh, and so like speaking of that fundamental analysis, what we're doing is we're looking at what the company itself is actually made of, right? Uh, and so what you're, you're just trying to see, is this company a good company? It's just being managed poorly, or they sure do seem to have a lot of idle assets. If they would go in and clean up house, they would probably would be a, a lot more profitable, that, that kind of thing. You're, you're looking at the fundamentals of the company uh, to see if it should be worth more, right? Um, and so that's that's what this fundamental analysis is. And normally when we talk about that, this looks really similar to what we did before, but now we're introducing this alpha term, that lowercase, looks like a cursive A, um, but that's a lowercase alpha, the Greek letter. Uh, and so if you ever hear anybody talk about uh, seeking alpha, right, or they're trying to get alpha, uh, alpha is like that additional return beyond the, the market riskiness, which is the beta, right? That, that's what <clears throat> reflects that. Alpha is like all this extra return that I got because I'm so good as an investor, right? Um, so that's that's where we're, we're looking at that. All right. And then uh, behavioral finance um, is when we start looking at how do people actually invest? Right. And this is where we start talking about people, um, you know, they're having a bad day and then that gets reflected in the market. So uh, years ago, when, when a lot more happened actually in New York City and things like that, uh, people actually had done research to show like bad weather in New York tends to be, you know, bad stock days and really nice weather in New York uh, tended to be really nice days. Uh, you know, higher, higher returns, you know, and I, I don't uh, know that that would hold today just the way people are distributed. Um, but we know people are people and people are weird. And, uh, and so like what we will see in the computer doesn't necessarily uh, show up, uh, you know, in, in markets, right? So, um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's a bit about the, the behavioral finance. There's a whole branch of research on that. Actually, I used to work in it a little bit myself and uh, some wonderful books in this area. So if you're interested in, in behavioral stuff, let me know, because that's, that's some stuff we could probably uh, get more into. So, um, but yeah, and, and obviously when you have this behavioral stuff, then that impacts market efficiency because, well, if I don't believe the information, right? I mean, you can introduce a lot more uh, things into it, right? Um, and so when we talk about this market efficiency, the, the things really to take away, um, one will be markets have no memory, right? And what that is saying is uh, you don't count on what happened today and say that's going to happen tomorrow, right? Um, the, we should probably trust market prices. I know that sounds strange, um, but you're saying that you're collectively, you got a better price than everyone in the market at that moment, right? So, um, you know, that's that's one of those those things, you know. Um, but yeah, so let's, let's move on. We'll do corporate uh, finance before I, I wrap this one up. So um, when we're talking about um, <clears throat> doing our, our corporate finance, normally what happens um, is the, the firm is making a decision, should I go out into new capital markets and raise money or should I use the profits that I've generated and not pay it back as dividends, right? And um, generally um, the investors won't care uh, what you do, right? If you, if you decide to, to pay dividends or if you reinvest the dividends, uh, because outside of taxes, uh, as an investor, you don't care because you can always you know, sell stock if you need the cash dividend. Uh, if you had cash dividends, you could turn around and, and buy more of the company stock if you'd rather just have it invested in the company. So you can always, you know, get to whatever position you want. Um, but from the corporate standpoint, obviously using internal financing means you don't have to introduce more uh, default risk. I mean, there's, there's, there's other reasons for them to make their choices. Um, 
And then whenever we're going uh, outside, uh, we can go to debt markets or you can go to equity markets or you can even do both, right? Um, and so once we once we have that, uh, we, we will bring this to a vote. Um, and so we'll, we'll vote on those issues. And another thing that we're always going to vote on are the board of directors, right? Because the board of directors are going to uh, represent the shareholders, right? And it's not to say they represent individual shareholders. And in fact, they often represent institutional shareholder interests because they hold so much. Um, but uh, for, for a lot, some companies, the entire board comes up each year. Um, some have what's called a classified board, which means like one third will come up each year. Uh, the classified board, it, it gives more stability, uh, but you could imagine in a situation like uh, Elon Musk, where he came in and bought Twitter, you know, uh, he's limited in how much change he can make, perhaps depending on how things are structured, right? Um, and so that, that's another thing that, that pops up. Um, some companies also will have dual class shares of stock. So Ford Motor Company has this, which is why you'll see a lot of people with the name Ford running the company, right? Because they, they have a, a special class that has higher voting benefits uh, for the Ford family. And then other shares that have higher dividend benefits for the for the just the investor class, right? Um, and so it just depends on um, you know how you um, how you want to structure uh, the company, right? Uh, there's also other things that we can do that would uh, look like equity, right? Uh, examples of this would be uh, partnerships, right? Because that's ownership, just like an equity stake is ownership. Um, the uh, a trust you probably have heard of trust funds and, and that kind of thing uh, a trust is, is where you would park an asset um, and allow you to go and do something else right and uh, so when you think if you've ever heard of a blind trust uh, politicians and put their stocks in, in that um, you know that kind of thing um, that, that would be in that trust and then a REIT is a real estate investment trust is a special type of trust that holds real estate. Uh, this, this is a very common investment vehicle uh, for people that are diversifying their portfolio because um, they'll have a, some percentage of their portfolio. It looks like a mutual fund basically when they're investing into it, but, uh, but it's actually in real estate. So when you're trying to spread out all of your investments with precious metals, stocks, bonds, you know, uh, you can use real estate, uh, some people are using crypto, right? There's all these things you can put in your portfolio, um, you know, that would, they, to build that, you know? Um, and uh, so uh, to talk a little bit more about particular types of stock, uh, we've, we've talked about common stock before, uh, but we also should bring up preferred stock. So preferred stock, uh, you have a, a claim over common stock, Right, so you're still stock, but you're you're above the common stock, and the payments on preferred look a lot like debt payments because normally they, they actually even get quoted as a percentage, right? Um, but but what that does is allows that debt to never mature, right? As long as they just want to keep paying the interest payments, right? They they have that preferred stock. Whether or not the stock is callable would be a something they build into it, but uh, but it's just a way for um, you to go and raise more financing uh, without going to debt markets. Like if you're distressed, banks aren't looking to lend you more money um, and, and that sort of thing. So it's just a way to do that. You also don't go back to equity markets where if you're already distressed, the, the equity markets are probably going to hammer you, right? So this preferred stock, you reach out to select investors. They, they're willing to give you the money at this higher interest rate. Uh, and this is just how we structure that. Um, and then the other side, of, out, other than the equities, obviously, would be looking at debt, right? Um, and so um, debt, um, we, we've already dealt with this with like the, the bonds, you know, and, and that kind of thing. So um, just understand that this, this is just another capital market that we could reach, right? Debt tends to be cheaper and debt gives a tax shield. Uh, but debt also introduces the, the possibility of default, right? So, so we have that. Uh, and then when we're making our debt decision, there's a lot that we have to talk about. Um, you know, what's the duration 
right? And so you try to get the duration of your loan to match the duration of the asset, um, you know, but you could have other restrictions where you need more long or short term. Uh, you know, the fixed rates and floating rates could be a big deal. Uh, borrowing in U.S. dollars or some other currencies, uh, you know, th those types of things. So there's there's a lot of ways that we can issue debt, and we probably need to have a lot of conversations to make sure this debt would fit within the, the strategic plan uh, for the firm. Um, and then there's other debts that show up within our accounts, right? And so just understand like an account payable, that is a debt, right? I, I owe the gas company or I owe some, some pay, you know, and that kind of thing. So this accounts payable is debt that I have as a short-term credit basically, right? Uh, unfunded obligations, if you've looked at U.S. government financing, um, you know, that's something, you know, um, where you've seen like what we call unfunded obligations around Medicare, Medicaid, um, you know, and you can actually have underfunded pensions for a firm, you know, things like that. That would be another form of debt that doesn't actually show up, you know. So, so just understand uh, debt has a lot, uh, a lot of different forms. Um, and then this is just to kind of show like where a lot of this um, money is coming from, how, sort of how it flows. So investors obviously reach out to financial markets. They can also go directly to financial intermediaries who will then go, uh, you know, and see, you know, what, what's, a, what's available. Um, and then obviously corporations are the ones that, uh, are reaching out through markets to to sell their bonds or their stocks, you know, and, and that kind of thing. So, um, so financial markets and financial intermediaries are different, right? The market is the actual place, right, where the financial assets are met, and then the intermediaries are all the different players within that market. So they both play a role, right? There's the market itself, and then there is uh, the financial intermediary, right, that that does all these things, and even things like. Um, mutual funds, right? That is an intermediary. A pension fund uh, is another one of those um, intermediaries, right? These are um, just different ways, um, you know, that we can um, interface with the market, you know. Uh, and then this is just to show uh, a bank and an insurance company, um, but a financial institution basically is a financial institution. And as you see, it's just, uh, they just process these, uh, you know, cash flows back and forth. And this what it shows this uh, flow of two and a half million. Normally there's a little bit of a difference, right? Because the financial intermediary is taking a little slice off the top. Uh, that's to provide them with those, um, those funds um, for their own profitability. Right. So, so why do we have, um, you know, all of these um, intermediaries? Uh, one thing is just to allow for, for faster payment, right? Uh, going through uh, a bank uh, can allow that uh, to go quickly. We, we have what's called a bank assurance where I can make a payment in a port here, and then you take payment in a port somewhere else when the goods uh, make it over or something like that. So, so we can have those set up. Um, you know, we can use borrowing and lending. Pooling risk is what insurance companies do. You know, so this is another example. Um, you know, so this is just um, financial markets, financial intermediaries are necessary for us to um, maintain our financial system. So hopefully this um, uh, clarifies that. But if you do have any questions uh, based on any of this, please just let me know.